as we come to our study, we're about half the way through the specific principles of the Mosaic Covenant, of the law. As you know, the Ten Commandments, we've looked at the first five thus far, and we're going to start today on the six through ten. We're getting into civil laws and how humans deal one with the another. We talked about authority beginning in the home and going all the way up to the, the local government, the spiritual leadership of the nation, and then, of course, the prophets. They represented God's very word to his people. And in that sense, they were the highest on the hierarchy because they were to speak to the kings and to the priests who were giving oversight to the nation. But we're going to come to commandment number six. Do you know what commandment number six is without looking? Thou shalt not kill. Now, if we're looking at a descending order of severity in terms of the offenses of breaking God's law, beginning with having other gods before him, making images, taking his name in vain, failing to keep the Sabbath set apart or holy unto the Lord. And, and of course, today the church does that by worshiping on that day, the traditional day of Sunday rather than Sabbath, but the principle is there. And then number five, honor your father and your mother. You say, honoring my father and my mother is more severe than taking someone's life? Well, they're all severe. In fact, the Bible says if you break one of the commandments, what happens? You've broken them all. So in that sense, don't try to measure it that way. But in God's do you know that those who refuse to honor the leadership that God has set up from the home all the way up to the highest leadership that he has placed over us, both civil and spiritual, is then to take a different attitude that will lead to behaviors like killing, committing adultery, stealing, bearing false witness, and coveting. So as you go down, if we will start with number one and make sure we keep those in order, Numbers 5 through 10 will be no issue for us. If you let number one through, numbers 1 through 4 get out of place, you fail to honor the Lord and worship Him and serve Him as you ought, you will struggle with commandments number 5 through 10. So there's a, there's a logical order. But these are also, as we mentioned, they are sort of the table of contents for the rest of the law. Now, as we're going through Deuteronomy, you'll notice that it seems like there was more detail back in Exodus and Leviticus and parts of Numbers, and there were. Deuteronomy is just a reminder of God's covenant, and then an expansion of some things that will take on a new relevance to them now that they are going into the land, and as this second generation is going to take possession of the promise God made to them all the way back in the person of Abraham in the book of Genesis. So we come today... I, I, I kind of drew my attention to where Moses, under the instruction of the Lord, began the rehearsal of this sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill. He begins with the cities of refuge and, and what they must do. This is now the third time that he has devoted a significant passage of Scripture. Actually, it's the fourth time it's dealt with in, in, since Exodus. But this tells you this is something important, and it will be dealt with in a whole chapter in the book of Joshua, Joshua chapter 20. So this matter of the cities of refuge is important to the Lord, but why? And we're going to look at that, and then he will get into the different types of taking of life, those that are sanctioned by the Lord and those that aren't. And we will look at those as we move ahead. But this morning, we're going to focus on these cities of refuge and... In the next hour, we're going to, it's interesting how the Lord brings these two series together in Deuteronomy and then in the life of Christ. We're going to focus on the theme of that preparing a way because both of these will now deal with that topic. So read with me, if you will, the beginning of chapter 19 of Deuteronomy. When the Lord thy God hath cut off the nations whose land the Lord thy God giveth thee, and thou succeedest them, and dwellest in their cities and in their houses. Thou shalt separate three cities for thee in the midst of the land of thy land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee to possess. Thou shalt prepare thee away, and divide the coasts of the land, 
which the Lord thy God giveth thee to inherit into three parts, that every slayer may flee thither. Let's, let's pause there. Let's pray. Father, as we open your word, guide our hearts, our thoughts. And Lord, may we again see through your eyes the importance, number one, of your standard, a holy standard, a righteous standard. But Lord, also may we see what is here in this text and so many others, the sanctity of life. Lord, the, the preserving of human life. Lord, and we're living in a day in which so much of the truth of your word is being denied. It is being canceled out. And in its place is coming a perverse and a, and a blasphemous doctrine and practice. And Lord, our country, we are seeing it placing a lesser and lesser importance and value upon life. Lord, help us to see anew this morning as we look at this passage and consider some other passages to remind ourselves again why life is so precious and why it is so valuable. Speak to our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we begin this about the cities of refuge, if we ask ourselves, why does God speak about it this many times? In Exodus 20, chapter 21, right after the giving of the law the first time there at Sinai, he makes the promise that he was going to provide a place for the one who committed manslaughter, not murder, but manslaughter, for them to flee to for protection. It was just an allusion to what he would do later. And then in Numbers chapter 35, he said that he stipulated the six cities would be established. Then in, in chapter 4 of Deuteronomy, in the historical review of the covenant, they shared that the three that had been determined on the western side of the Jordan River that they had already conquered, those had already been set. Now in chapter 19, he's going to look at the three cities on the eastern side. We don't yet see them named here. They will be named over in the book of Joshua. But... He's going to remind them, because Moses isn't going with them, remember that, because of his sin. So he's going to remain. He will die on the western side of the Jordan River. But the children of Israel, when you go in, don't you forget to set up those cities of refuge. Because that is something the Lord specified. And not only that, but he's going to make another provision, which we'll look at in a moment. It never came to pass, at least not yet. It may in the millennial kingdom. I don't know. I don't even know if it's going to be necessary then or not. But we're going to see that in this passage. But what jumps out at us is he begins not so much with the taking of life, but he talks with the about the preserving of innocent life. Why is life so valuable to the Lord? Well, first of all, let's talk about its nature. What is the nature of life? Have you been, I'm fascinated, though, in a sense, disgusted as well by the technology that's come along whereby people are finding ways to clone different animals or even some are trying cloning humans. But the thing, that it's, it's disgusting in the sense they're trying to play God, but it's fascinating in the sense that they have not yet, while they can take what God has made and created and done, they do not yet realize that they cannot give life. They cannot reproduce life. God created man out of the dust of the earth, and he formed him, and the Bible says he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And from that point forward, that life has transferred from man to man to man through the seed of Adam. And to this day, so the nature of life, it is God breathed and no man will ever reproduce life. He may manipulate what God has created, but he will never create it as God did. Secondly, its origin, it's God given. He is the one who gives it and the Bible also says he is the one who takes it. No other person has that right. Thirdly, it's preservation. It is God sustained. In fact, the very breath we breathe is there because God allows it to be. Colossians chapter 1 tells us that not only did he create the world, 
but he, he's the one, by the power of his word, this universe we live in consists. What keeps the oxygen in the air for us to breathe? The power of the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you stop and think that by the power of the word, all that was made was made. By the power of his word, everything that is made is sustained and consists today. And First Peter tells us, uh, Second Peter, I'm sorry, tells us that by the power of his word in the Hebrews also, he will speak one day and all that's here will dissolve. See, physicists to this day cannot explain the relationship between protons, neutrons, and electrons. What keeps them in that tight configuration spinning around each other because all of logic and science says they should push apart, and they don't. And when man was successful in splitting that atom, what happens? Massive devastation. Literally, things dissolve around. And when the Lord speaks, he's preserving. We, those who think that we will destroy this planet and we will destroy nature, no, we won't. Now, we should be good stewards, but you will never, ever be able to do what God, the Bible says, has reserved a judgment that he himself will execute. And at his time, when he speaks the word, the Lord Jesus will speak it, and the, wor the world as we know it will be dissolved. And there will be a new heaven and a new earth. So stop and think about this. It is not only breathed by God, it's given by God, it's sustained by God. And what's its purpose? The Bible tells us that we were created for his glory. Our purpose in life as human beings is to glorify God. Oh, preacher, but you mean Christians, right? Well, yes, but not just Christians. Every man, woman, boy, and girl. Our purpose in life. And when we do not do that, we never fulfill the purpose for which we were created. You talk about depression. You talk about dissatisfaction. You talk about always trying to find something or get ahead in some way. It's because they're not content to fulfill the role God has given them. And here's the other part. They will never be content outside of God's will. Well, our purpose is there and also the end of life. We were not created to die, folks. Do you realize that? You say, well, death is just part of life. No, it's not. Death is a curse. Before Adam sinned in Genesis chapter 3, there was no death on earth. Do you realize that? Now stop and think about this. Brother Earl said Gene froze some of those leftovers. Now we know where to go, don't we? <laughs> we know where the stash is. But if Adam had not sinned, there would be no death. We wouldn't have to plant gardens. We wouldn't eat turkeys either, by the way. Before the, before the, the end of the flood... There, we, man was a vegetarian. They were not given the leeway to eat meat until after the Genesis flood. But imagine you would never have, you wouldn't have all the leaves dying in the winter and all this mess that we have and things, our, the wood on our houses rotting and all these other things. There would be no death. There'd be no decay. There'd be no rust. Imagine buying a car and it'd never, never go bad on you. Cooking food and you don't have to freeze it and it doesn't spoil. Death is not natural. Death is a curse given by God as a result of sin. How do we know this? Well, turn with me to Romans chapter 5 for a moment. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, that would be Adam, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So up until he sinned, there was no death for mankind. But he being that one, the first Adam, he, te he failed the test. And then the second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, he came and he passed that test and became that acceptable sacrifice to go to Calvary. But understand, the end of life came as a curse because of sin. So 
We also will see the remedy, and we'll speak of that more in the next hour, and that's God's gift, which is everlasting life. So this, in this passage, I want you to, we're going to consider the priority of the preservation of human life. Human life is distinct from all other life on earth. Human life is said to, man has been created in the image and likeness of God. Genesis chapter 1, it tells us this. When God created Adam and Eve, for that matter, it says in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now, what image and likeness is this? It's not physical, because God does not have a physical body. So it's a moral likeness. So he, he, he said, We will create him after our image and likeness, and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over the earth. And over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, so God created man in his own image. In the image, in God, in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now jump forward to chapter 9. There are those who suggest that in the fall, when Adam sinned, the image of God was removed from man and he no longer bore the image of God. Well, that's not true, because in Genesis 9, verse 6, this is not only after the fall, but it's after the flood, when God destroyed all life on earth, save what was preserved in the ark. Look at verse 6 of Genesis 9. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, in other words, who takes the life of a human being, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. So the image of God is still, while it is marred while it is affected by the fall and by sin it is not removed and then you say well what about in the new testament is it does it confirm yes in james chapter 3 verse 9 remember it talks about the tongue with the same tongue we bless god and we curse man who's created in the image of god so yes we are created after god's image and likeness and therefore to take a human life is is to attack the very image of god himself no, we are not gods. That's not what we're saying. Don't confuse that. But it is something that God made, God sustains, and only God has the right to take away. Now, coming back to the cities of refuge, to God's people, he wanted to instill into them the importance and the value of innocent life. So he established these cities of refuge, a place where if a man took the life of another man, and notice this, he reminds them three times in these verses, The Lord thy God giveth you this land. Verse 2, In the midst of the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee to possess it. Verse 3, Thou shalt prepare thee away and divide the coast in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Does he want them to remember who gave them this land? I think so. And they soon forget. Just as we soon forget all that God has done for us. So he, he promised it in Exodus 21, 13, and he spelled it out that there would be six cities. Now that they're going to be the three, two and a half tribes are on the Transjordan side, the western side. So three there, and now he's reminding them here in chapter 19 of Deuteronomy to make the three cities. So who are these cities for? So this means anybody who kills another person, he gets to get immunity. He gets to get asylum in these cities. They say, well, that doesn't seem fair. Well, that's not exactly the way it works. God makes a clear distinction between murder, premeditated taking of life, and, and, or willful taking of life, and manslaughter, which is the accidental or involuntary taking of human life. And there's a clear distinction, and there is a provision that he makes. I want you to look here in verses 4 and following. And what we're going to see here is the priority of innocent life. He starts there. He doesn't start with the guilty. He starts with the innocent because even as we have in our legal system in America, which mirrors, by the way, the Mosaic law, the principles of God's law, in America we have a jury system set up and a judicial system that they would rather let 10 guilty go than to put one innocent in prison. 
And that is the concept that God also seems to instill in his people here. Look here in verse, verse 3, he already said, These cities are so that the, the slayer, that's the idea of the manslayer or the, of manslaughter, that he can flee there until his case can be adjudicated and the provision God makes put into place. And he gives an illustration here in verse 4 about the priority of innocent life. Look at verse 4. And, in this, and this is the case of the slayer, or the one who takes a life involuntarily, which shall flee thither that he may live. Whoso killeth his neighbor ignorantly, whom he hated not in times past, as when a man goeth into the woods with his neighbor to hew wood or cut down wood. And his hand fetcheth a stroke with the axe to cut down the tree, and the head slippeth off the helm, and lighteth upon his neighbor that he die. He shall flee into one of those cities and live. So he he gives the illustration. We're going out to chop wood, and the head slips off the axe when I'm swinging against the trunk of the tree, and it hits my neighbor who's out there, and we're working together, and it kills him. I didn't mean to do that. That was an involuntary, it was an accidental death. But yet in the passions of this type of an event, one family becomes angry and the other, and what happens? Look at verse 6. Lest the avenger of blood. Now the avenger of blood, this was someone who under Mosaic law and under traditions of that day and to this day in many Middle Eastern countries, it's one of the, the nearest kinsmen of the person who died has the responsibility to go and take the life of the one who took his life. And when in the passions of this, today they become a mob. It's not just one that goes after him. It's the entire family and community that you go after and they will stone him to death to then try to find out what happened. Well, the number one witness in the case has now been stoned to death so he can't really tell what's happened. So in the God knowing the heart of man and the heat of passion when we respond before we know what we are doing. We respond before we know the facts. The Bible says the fool judges a matter before he hears it. So verse 6 says, Lest the avenger of blood pursue the slayer while his heart is hot. In other words, in the passion of the moment. And overtake him, and because the way is long to the city of refuge, Slay him whereas he was not worthy of death. He, he did not deserve to die because it was accidental. Inasmuch as he hated him not in the past. Wherefore I command thee, saying, Thou shalt separate three cities for thee. Now he's talking about, you've already done three on the western side of the Jordan. Now you're going to do three on the eastern side in Canaan proper. So what is, what is the point here? This is a place, you're going to divide the land by the coast. You're going to put one in the northern part, one in the central part, one in the southern part of Israel. So that just as on the western side, no matter where this takes place in the land, there will be about an equal distance to one of the cities of refuge. It is to be accessible to all. You're going to prepare a way. And that way is to be so wide, is to be so cleared, and is to be so marked that he does not have to stop to ask anyone how to get to a city of refuge. The way is marked, it is clear, and all he has to do is follow it. That is how important. And these, these ways, by the Talmud, one of the legal documents and things of the Jewish people, they were to be done annually for the main highways. But I don't know how often it may have been more frequent than annually for these highways to the city of refuge. And we'll... we'll Look at that a little more in the next hour. But we see here that they were to be accessible because it should not be so far that whoever took the life accidentally could not make it there before the avenger of blood caught him and took his life. Because under the law then and to this day, that is permitted and in some case without recourse today. But God is also trying to preserve the avenger of blood because if he takes a life of an innocent man and later discovers I shouldn't have done it, he shouldn't have died, then he becomes guilty of taking innocent life. And he did it premeditatedly, even though he was mistaken. And there could be provisions for that as well. So, the priority of innocent life. Secondly, the protection of innocent life. By the way, verses 8 and 9 speak of something interesting. It says, and if the Lord enlarge thy coast, 
as he hath sworn unto thy fathers, and give thee the land which he hath promised to give to thy fathers. Remember that Israel has never possessed the full Abrahamic land grant. It's supposed to go all the way over to the Euphrates River and all the way down and over. So much of the Middle East actually belongs to the Abrahamic covenant. But they have never possessed it. And God, God already said, you've already have three on the western side of the Jordan. You have three on the eastern side of the Jordan. But if God grants you this full property, you will make three more cities. Now, under David, they conquered many of those lands, but never colonized. They simply made them tributaries. They paid tributes to David. Solomon inherited that. And then so they soon lost all that property. And to this day, they have never possessed it. But God made a provision even then that if that were the case, three more cities would be set up in those territories. Will that be done in the millennial kingdom? I don't know. It's a possibility because there will still be sinners and there will be, still be people that do things that violate God's law. How will it all be dealt with? Well, we don't know all those details for sure. But the reason he mentions it here, does that mean that that's going to happen in the millennial kingdom? Very possible. But it was provided. But here's, here's also verse 9 is kind of a prophecy as to the fact that it's never going to happen. Moses has already alluded to repeatedly in Deuteronomy that if you will go in and you'll, serve, you'll love the Lord with all your heart, your soul, and might, and you'll serve him, then God's going to provide all these blessings. Your enemies will not triumph. You will prosper and you will rule over them. But if you disobey, and he, he basically goes and says, now when you get in there and you turn from the Lord and you go after false idols, this is what God is going to do. He speaks of it as though it is a given because he sort of knows their heart. And the verse 9 says, if thou shalt keep all these commandments to do them, which I command thee this day, to love the Lord thy God, to walk ever in his ways, then shalt thou add three cities more for thee beside these three. So now we have six said, now, if you will obey the Lord, like he said, you'll need to add these other three and make it nine before too much longer. But the fact that they were never done tells us kind of in a summary form, the history of their disobedience. Look with me very quickly at the protection of innocent life. Verse 10 says, the innocent blood be not shed, that innocent blood be not shed in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance, and so blood be upon thee. You prepare that way, you prepare the cities that that innocent person may run. Now what happens when they come to the city? And this goes back to Numbers 35, and you can go back and read that, and then Deuteronomy 4 as well. But basically, that in the instance of that man who was out cutting wood and the axe head flies off and kills his neighbor, his immediate response is, you go to the city of refuge. You get inside those, inside those gates, he was safe. Now let's suppose he had killed him premeditatedly. Willfully, he went out there. He had, he had had enough of his neighbor. He didn't like his neighbor. and He decided, I'm going to do something about it. And he took his neighbor's life and he ran to that city. Is he protected? Well, he is for the moment. But when the elders of that city, now who are the elders? This is, remember, it's a Levitical city, which means the elders of the city would be of the Levites, the priests. And these were part of the spiritual leadership. And they would come and they would hear the witnesses. We're going to look at that in the next message. Not today, but probably Wednesday. They would come, and they would not at one mouth of one witness, but two or more witnesses. Anything related to the, the capital punishment had to be more than one witness. But they would come, and they would hear the one who took the life, they'd hear the witnesses against him, and they would make a determination whether that was willful, it was manslaughter, or whether it was murder. And so they would make that choice and determination. If it was murder, they do not receive asylum. Only those. Now, here's the key, and this is where it becomes a picture of the Lord Jesus. The one who committed manslaughter, involuntary taking of human life, they couldn't go home. You know, we, we saw two trials in the past few days, didn't we? One of a young man who 
took life there in the protest. And it's sad, the, the result of sin and turning from the Lord, that all of that was. But how that the jury system came and evaluated the evidence that they came to a unanimous verdict that no, he is not guilty. And immediately when that trial was over, he was set free. He could go home, well, wherever he was allowed to go. Because they're fearful for his life right now. But on the other hand, we, we saw those three, I believe it was, who were being tried for taking the life of someone else. And they were all three categorically considered guilty. And so they're remanded for punishment. So those in the, but in the Old Testament days, when you were guilty of manslaughter, not murder, manslaughter, you could not go home. They, were, they would take them under protection back to that city of refuge where he would remain until the death of the high priest. So he had to stay there. Now if the high priest had just taken over office and he still had quite a few years to serve, he might be there for a while. It could be a decade or more. If the high priest were way up in age, he may be there just a matter of weeks or months. But the point was, they were to be there, and the death of the high priest became the final, in a sense, payment or covering for that manslaughter so that the man could then go back, take over his inheritance, his family, and continue his life where it was, and no one could touch him. That is a picture of what the Lord Jesus d does for us. We are under that penalty of guilt until he came and he died on the cross of Calvary. And that's why throughout Scripture, he is called our refuge. He is the place where we flee. Because unlike this situation of manslaughter versus murder, he came to deal with the matter of sin. And how many of us are sinners? All of us. How many of us need refuge? All of us. And until... He came and he died on that cross as our high priest, as Hebrews tells us. We were not free from the penalty and the power of sin. But now that he has died, we're free from the penalty, the power, and one day we'll be free from the presence of sin. So these are, are clear pictures and types of the Lord Jesus and what he would accomplish. But notice also the provision for those who indeed violated that sixth commandment and they took the life of willfully verse 11 but if any man hate his neighbor and he lies in wait for him and rise up against him and smite him mortally that he die and fleeth into one of these cities then the elders of, the, of his city shall send and fetch him thence and deliver him into the hand of the avenger of blood that he may die those who are guilty are not to find asylum in these cities of refuge because to do so Look at verse 13. Thine eye shall not have pity on him, but thou shalt put away the guilt of innocent blood from Israel, that it may go well with thee. A nation who tolerates this type of low view of the sanctity of human life, it will not go well for that nation. America for many years now, over 50 years, has not valued human life. So how can you say that? We have the death penalty. We have, well, not many places anymore. And it's used even less. But I'm talking about the slaughter of unborn babies in the womb. Folks, we look back at some of these places and these lands and things, and we look down upon them. We look to the Middle East where... Some nations have pretty rough laws. Korea, China. But what about America? Where the government protects the privilege of simply a mother saying, I don't want that child. I don't want the consequences of my choices in sin. And slaughters that defenseless, innocent life. This is something that is important to our country right now, the value 
and the preservation of human life. And that is the focus of this, even though it is a picture of something much greater in the person of Jesus Christ, which we're going to look at in the next hour as we go to the New Testament and look from that perspective upon this very thing. But again, evaluate anew in your life and mine. How do we view life? Do we see it as God-breathed and God-given and God-sustained? And at the end of it, yes, it is a curse from God, but he even makes, as we look at the remedy in the next hour, he makes a provision even for that. But you and I should never become desensitized to how God views life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for life. Without you having created us and breathed it into us, we would have never had it. And Lord, to understand that you created us distinct from the rest of creation and that you made us after your image and likeness that we might fellowship with you, that we might have a relationship with you and one day we may be with you. Lord, help us to understand our responsibility. And as it relates to others, may we be concerned and value life as you do. Lord, I pray for our country that you would turn it back to you. Lord, that this cheap view of life that we see today, that you would convict us of that as a nation, that you would cause us to repent and turn back. And Lord, if you would have mercy upon us. But Lord, even more so, as we will see in the next hour, may we be convicted about the even greater concern for eternal life and all that is entailed in there. Apply your word now to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.